most awesome missing. The Carl Nelson Show. You're rocking with the most awesome missing. All right, let's go. And good morning, Wake Up Squad, and thanks for starting your week with us again. We hope you had a great weekend. Later this Monday morning, Kwanzaa Creator. Dr. Molana Karenga will return to our classroom. Dr. Karenga will weigh in on the Gaza-Israel conflict. Dr. Karenga will also explain how the principles of Kwanzaa and how it became an international celebration. Before we hear from Dr. Karenga, though, former Louisiana State Trooper Carl Cavalier will update us on his fight to get his job back. You may recall he was fired after blowing the whistle on on a group of white state troopers covering up the death of a black motorist. But to get us started, Baltimore activist Kim Poole is here. Good morning, Kim. Good morning, Carl. How are you? Excellent. How are you? I'm good. We've had such a busy year. Uh, I'm excited to be home for the holidays. I can't even imagine hearing myself say that, but I am no place like home. We work all over the world, and we're doing good work to facilitate those cross-cultural dialogues between global African people, but no place like home. Glad to be in Baltimore. Okay, let's let's talk about that because you you spend a lot of time in Africa, uh, you know. Most folks, when we go to Africa, we spend one of two days or three days the most in, in one particular country. It's like you parachute in, and then you're out, and, and you know you you don't really get a chance to understand what's going on. You know, if you go visit a city for one day, then you come back with a conclusion. This is how this particular city or state is. But you spent a lot of time there as a singer and activist. What was your vision when you started? Uh, we want to talk about this country in a moment, but what was your, your vision when you founded the TIA, the Teaching Arts Institute in, in Baltimore? Honestly, it was an opportunity for us to legitimize the work of artivists. Uh, oftentimes you find artists are somehow uh, like oxygen in communities, facilitating dialogue. We all work in an ecosystem, and that community is full of partners and uh, practitioners and the doers and artists. They inspire creativity, and the connections that they facilitate, it's often difficult to legitimize and value to validate that work. And so when we began in November, uh, November, we're looking at our anniversary soon, uh, of 2015, I, I remember it just being a conversation at Coppin State University with myself and Dr. Hyatt with the Department of Visual and Performing Arts about how to give credit to the infusion, the integration of arts in, in community, uh, arts integration into community. What does that look like? And so our our fellowship program was an opportunity to do that for artists that were selected. And since then, it's grown well beyond that initial vision into eight countries. And now it looks different based on the symbolic landscape that we work in. And so we're looking at how does art Uh, become integrated across sector, not just music. Music is essential. Uh, I'm a performing artist, and I I love music, but it is so much bigger than music. I heard someone, he he wrote a book, It's Bigger Than Hip Hop. Really, it's not. Uh, Music is vibration. It's creation. And to perform is to activate the divinity in you. Uh, God spoke and said, let there be light. And that uh, ability to create is like acknowledging the fact that you, too, have that power. Um, However, uh, encouraging other sectors to think with the creativity of the artist class. Uh, Now we do that across sector in different countries, and it requires skills like mutual understanding. It takes us into elections, and we're like, wait, we're not politicians, but we realize that we need to be able to communicate and encourage transparency during elections. It takes us into boardrooms where we teach corporate entities, uh, you know, cross-cultural communication, and we teach them about uh, social corporate responsibility. And so we're doing art-led professional development. It takes us, of course, into the classrooms. They love when we teach kids how to uh, be more responsible and uh, how to activate their sensitivity with paint and murals. But it's, it's become so much more than our original vision in November of 2015. And I'm happy to celebrate our anniversary here with you today. 
Well, let me ask you this, because, you know, are you treated differently? Because you're an artist. For the average person who goes to one of these African nations, are they treated the same way that you were treated? So uh, I have to say that uh, for me, there's an artist in each of us. And sometimes we deny that creativity when we're told by society that artists aren't the serious people or that only some of us can make it and uh, turn that into a profession or a career. And so I wouldn't say that the average person treats it differently than I would um, simply because I'm an artist. I would say that uh, many people, because they meet me and they're like, oh, you're younger than I expected, they don't realize that I've been doing this work to facilitate connections between global African people across the continent since I was wow, 21. And so we're looking at almost like just over 20 years of work um, in doing this work. And so, yes, it may be a little different than the average tourist uh, or professor looking for sabbatical or student getting uh, study abroad credit than when I show up there in the space, but only because of time and work and experience. But as an artist, no, absolutely not. Uh, being able to experience Africa for the first time, it never gets old. I experience it the same way when we go into the same countries or if we go into new countries with new people. Every time we go, it's a new experience. Uh, we had maybe six tours uh, this past fall. And so going with different people, it creates a new experience every time. And I look forward to that. There is no difference. Um, I think that some people, because of the experience for them, it gets maybe old and they're like, oh, I've done that Africa thing. I did it back in the day, or I've read so many books and watched so many YouTubes that I know what Africa is, even without setting foot on the soil. Uh, it never gets old. And being uh, on the continent, putting your feet on the ground, that vibration is one that is renewing. It's uh, refreshing. It's a breath of fresh air. All right. Eight after the top there. Can you remember the first, your first visit? What was that like? What was your first, when you put your first foot that landed on African soil, what was that like? Well, I'll tell you, it was <laughs> many years ago, but I remember it just as it was yesterday. I was actually with Anthony Browder, and I was in Egypt. I had a performance in Greece, and you would be surprised how close Egypt is to Greece until you read Stolen Land, Stolen People, or that's actually my campaign, <laughs> The Stolen Legacy. And when you read that book, it really puts into context uh, how much of Egypt or Kemet uh, was uh, influencing uh, the, the Greek culture. And so I, I think once I actually got on a plane and did a tour performing, we went to Dirty Ginger and so many locations across uh, Greece as a country to perform. And then after that, I went on a tour into uh, Luxor or what we would now call Waset with uh, Anthony Browder. And that was during the Arab Spring. They told us to stay home like our lives depended on it. A man had just set himself on fire. And that experience caused us to be the only excavation team um, in the entire country at that time. And so it was a major media circus. We saw people protesting and they had their signs. But to us being on the ground, we could see how the media was exploiting uh, the local narrative because Everywhere outside of where the camera was focused in that middle of town, everything else was moving as normal where we were in Luxor. And being in Africa for that time, uh, I, I really feel like I was glad that I had a historical context and that I read, but it, I couldn't wait until I got into the rest of Africa because that experience, it was so much more different than, say, Ghana for the first time, where I actually saw uh, black people that were still practicing uh, traditional African culture, whereas being in Egypt, it really felt like an Arabian experience in Luxor and you know, in the South, they Abu Simbel, et cetera. You could see based on the figurines and the monuments that this is an African area. The local people, they would say, hey, my Nubian sister, they felt a sense of connection. I appreciated that camaraderie, and it was like taking history off the page uh, to go into the monuments. And, but 
for me, uh, Africa uh, as a practice, as a lifestyle with African people that are still interested in promoting and preserving the African identity, I didn't really experience that in Egypt, um, as some people might. Um, I began to do that once I went into West Africa, which was next for me um, in Ghana. Ghana is home. It's the first of so many things. Uh, we love uh, what Ghana does to invite the diaspora, but in Ghana, I felt like uh, a tourist. I felt like Africa had been packaged into something that I could buy or consume in a T-shirt and that they understood my need for a reconnection uh, for my identity. And they were using that uh, to their country's bottom line's advantage. It's great business. It's smart. Uh, but I wanted even more than that. Honestly, it was when I began to go to East and Southern Africa that I really felt at home where I felt like the people weren't necessarily looking at me as an outsider like they were in Egypt, and they weren't looking at me as an opportunity for financial gain uh, solely uh, as when I was in West Africa. It was when I was in East Africa and sometimes Southern Africa that I felt like, oh, wow, I could live here. I could see myself as a part of the community, not only because I'm in search of identity, but because um, – they need my skill in the community, and it's thriving, and I could be a part of this collective. It's nice to be able to do that comparative analysis, and I think that's what the Teaching Artists Institute and Tie Tours offer, because we started this work, most of us, in our own development before, years and years before we began to offer it as a service and opportunity to the community. Right. Let me ask you this then. Of all the countries that you visited, because you just said the regions, uh, which one would you feel most at home that you feel that you could leave Baltimore and, and set up shop? Which one of these African states do you favor? You know, actually, it's regional. Uh, we know that the colonizer, that while we were here enslaved, that uh, in the diaspora, that on the continent, it was partitioned, 1854, the scramble for Africa. It's interesting now that we are coming up on 2024. I look and I'm reminded of the resilience of us, how quickly we bounce back from how they partitioned Africa based on its resources and created these uh, border states. But the truth is, Africa is a regional place. It's territorial and based on ethnic groups and nations uh, that uh, manage the resources of certain regions. And so uh, to say that, oh, it's Tanzania or, oh, it's Zimbabwe or, oh, it's Uganda, that would be really difficult. It would, one, mean that I had to use the lens of the colonial master, which was never uh, effective for Africa. And it's still very um, unrealistic. Once you're actually working on the ground, you find uh, the Luol people that are in Kenya, but they've migrated from Hell Gazelle. And so now they're in Uganda and they're also in Kenya. And so to work with those people and to feel a part of them means that you're already into two regions. Um, it's the same in uh, Zimbabwe, even though I don't very much feel at home in South Africa. I love Zimbabwe and the culture around Victoria Falls and, you know, the people that are there, the Indebele and, you know, the Zulu, uh, their, you know, that strength, that power. I resonate with that. And so really it's regional, but I'm going to say the South and the East. I love West. West is my passport. Uh, African Americans, we went into the West and, and we, you know, we've come a long way since we helped to recognize Liberia and establish that. And so, you know, ECOWAS is base. That's home. That's ground zero for many of us. Uh, but I feel very much at home in Eastern Southern Africa. All right, hold that thought right there. We've got to take our first look at the traffic and weather in our different cities. When we come back, though, I want to talk to you about Liberia, since you mentioned Liberia. Folks, you want to join this conversation with our guest, Kim Poole, out of Baltimore? Reach out to us at 800-450-7876 at 14 after the top of the hour. We'll take your calls in four minutes right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB and in the DMV on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, or information is power. Good morning again, family. 21 minutes after the top of the hour with Baltimore activist Kim Poole on this Monday morning. Uh, Kim has been to Africa several times, several different countries and taken tours to Africa and before his last return to about Liberia. But Kim, I understand that you have been invited back to perform at the new president of Liberia. How did that, tell us how that came about. 
skim there. Yeah, sorry. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Did you hear the question? No. Okay, the question is good, you know, because you went, you've, you've been to Liberia and there's several other countries, but you went to Liberia and you've been invited back to perform for the new president of Liberia. I want to know how that came about because you, you new government's coming in and they, they ask you to perform. You're not even from Liberia and they ask you, how did that come about? Well, I'll tell you, Carl, the work we've been doing has taken us into really interesting places. And oftentimes the entities that we work with are surprised that I'm also a traditional artist. And so when they are exposed to that part of uh, my artistry, uh, they automatically create opportunities for me to you know, have a platform on their stages. I knew first uh, President Joseph Bokai uh, many years ago in uh, 2017. Uh, in 2018, I was first invited to Liberia to talk about art for social transformation and what it looked like uh, for women to come to the front of movements and inspire creativity and to serve as resource managers in the marketplace. And so, uh, in 2018, he, um, I believe, what an impression was made. Uh, my Louise Sewa, she was the former Minister of Tourism and Culture under uh, uh, Sir Leif Johnson. Uh, she was the first uh, African woman uh, to serve in leadership as a president uh, in Africa. And so she was familiar with Visa for Music, um, entities like Morocco that engage artists from around the world. She helped facilitate spaces like that. And my Louise, she followed up that work even beyond uh, her job description as the Minister of Tourism and Culture, because this is a work that you do not just because somebody has, um, you know, given you a job, but it's your, your life's work. And so my Louise, I met um, in that environment, and she already knew about my work. And they said, Kim, we couldn't think of another artist uh, that represents the diaspora that's proud that we want to come and celebrate with us. So the fact that I can actually sing a little bit, <laughs> I guess that's just icing on the cake. I think even if I was a poet, they would probably invite me on stage to do a something. And so I'm, ex I'm excited and I'm celebrating because really uh, they called it a rescue mission. And I appreciate the fact that George Wea humbly stepped down. Uh, Liberia has a history of being violent during and surrounding election time, but I have to say it was one of the most peaceful elections. I was there on the ground with the rescue team uh, during the election and in the final days leading up to the vote, and the people were excited uh, on both sides, but I have to say that they were young on both sides. People forget that Africa is one of the youngest continents uh, in the world, not just countries in Liberia, but youngest continents. And so you're watching this vibrant energy of young people, the largest wave of first-time voters. They really had something to say, and they came out and they said it. And so uh, we call him Grandpa Bokai. He's coming back. You know, he's in his 80s, and he has the experience, but he's open to the young people, uh, shaping them and preparing them for the mantle. And the fact that he sees art and culture as a part of that conversation, that he is is willing to help legitimize the role of artists at decision-making tables. He's the type of leadership that needs to be duplicated, and I'm glad that he's had time to reflect on his administration in previous years serving under, uh, you know, Sir Lee Johnson, and I'm glad that he's decided that this time around, if I ever get another chance at the mantle, I want to make sure that culture is central to the discussion, that the diaspora, the historic diaspora, is central to the discussion. Right now, like Liberia is fertile ground, and I'm telling you from firsthand experience, the young people are ready. One of the biggest human resource pools, uh, and they're trained, they're educated, and we're talking about a country that had a 70% illiteracy rate, right? And so the work ahead of us is, is still major. This is only the beginning, but artists are at the table, and they've invited me to do that. I can't wait to go and perform and welcome His Excellency onto the stage and talk about how the historic diaspora is going to be a part of this conversation next year and beyond. Wow, 26 after the top. I got a tweet whether while you were uh, saying all that about Liberia. person tweeted, wanted to know, what are the uh, business opportunities in Liberia? 
Well, let's look at historically what they've been exploited for. We know that all of our tires here in the USA are made with rubber from Liberia. When we think about uh, the opportunities uh, for investment, let's just start with what industries we haven't been able to tap into as a historic diaspora. And, you know, yearwood and, uh, you know, I, I won't fire stone. There's literally plants and manufacturing. And sometimes we think the exploitation of colonial powers is uh, the 1800s, the 1600s, but it's not. It's today. It's still happening. And those companies, they still have major, um, you know, major plants in these regions. And so uh, why not us? Why not in partnership? Why not fair trade? Can we not be a part of that conversation and write, rewriting history and creating our own moving forward? Absolutely we can. And so think about the natural resources. Think about cacao. They have one of the most fertile soils. I said it was fertile ground. That wasn't just theoretical. It was also literally agriculture in Liberia is a huge opportunity. It isn't even something that needs major investment to begin. Sometimes we think about investment. We did an investment toward this. Uh, this past October, and we're thinking we need, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to enter the market. Sometimes really what you just need is a strong on-ground partner that's willing to help do some of the legwork, and agriculture is a, a great opportunity. Lemongrass, it just grows that way. Moringa, it just grows that way. And so it doesn't always need to be this mass, uh, this duplication of what has been this single cropping farming that we've seen that's depleted our souls. Sometimes it's just supporting what already exists and providing infrastructure around manufacturing. Manufacturing is a major industry that's needed uh, because they don't have an opportunity to create these value added products because there's no manufacturing. And so we're finding that the same thing that was started during the industrial revolution in European countries where we're taking raw resources from the continent manufacturing them in Europe outside of the continent and then selling them back to the continent is still a problem today. And so how do we disrupt that narrative? We get involved in the story and we decide, yes, I want to start a business. And a part of Teaching Artists Institute, our business is tourism and hospitality management, but also consultancy, creating that bridge, facilitating those dialogues. And so I don't know who you are, Twitter user, but if you're interested in starting a business on the continent, we can connect you to the people that are interested. We're working with local governments and national governments like Liberia. Uh, so this is not a middleman uh, where we're connecting you to somebody that's connecting you to somebody. Because we've done the work in building community, because we have what we call culture as the new currency, we're using our relational economy to build relationships so you don't have to fail. You don't have to meet the first person after kissing this frog and that frog. We connect you to the person that can help your business grow the first time around. So contact us. All right. And before she goes, she'll leave, out a, uh, leave her contact number. But let me ask you about entertainment, because that's you're, you're also an entertainer. The, the young folks that you find on the continent, are they, from what I understand, many of them are in rap music. Are you finding they're asking you about some of the, the rap icons uh, that we created on this side of the ocean? Absolutely. They tell us we have no flag, we have no language, you people have no culture. But when you travel, all it does is reaffirm how much culture we've created and how that culture um, has influenced the entire world youth popular culture, especially through mediums like hip-hop. And now here in the 50th year, the 50th anniversary, uh, if Minister Server out of Atlanta was on the line, he would say that November is Hip-Hop History Month. He created the Hip-Hop Declaration of Peace, now being used as an instrument at the United Nations to facilitate artist-led civic engagement. And so when we think about how young people have gravitated uh, to this art form and use it as a tool to express how they see or what they see as injustice in their community, the same way that our original hip-hop artists 
did uh, here in the U.S., it reminds me of, one, the strength of the youth, and it also reminds me of the artist class and our power to define reality, to ensure that we not only tell the people what we're thinking about, but what they should be considering, what they should think. And so encouraging that critical thinking, it's essential. And I think the hip-hop artists now, uh, sometimes they don't always reflect that power uh, now that it's been commercialized. But in the 50th year, let us take on that original energy and reclaim this industry. All right, 29 away from the top. Are you also working with Dr. David Horn? Can you tell us about that collaboration? Yes, that is my Mwali Mu, my mentor, uh, Dr. Horn, uh, the work of the Six Region Diaspora Caucus, or what we may know as SRDC, is impactful. When I first started, uh, when I decided that the work I was doing in Art for Social Transformation was a global conversation, Dr. David Horn was one of my uh, most influential uh, mentors, or uh, what I would call Jegnas. He made sure that I had those connections so that I could begin the conversations with the right people. And so I sometimes stand on his shoulders because I see the work he's been doing over 40 years and the fact that I didn't have to fail first because I was talking to the person that was the right person the first time around through his network. And so I'll always be humbled to that. No matter how big we grow or what we build, it will always celebrate the work of Dr. David Horn. Uh, And right now um, I'm able to, in Uh, because he's invested in me, able to now connect him to people that are doing the work on the continent because we are boots on the ground. Uh, Africa is our everyday. We're working in these regions not only when we do a tour uh, or uh, provide a study abroad or cross-cultural exchange opportunity for the individual that's coming, but this is our all-year-long work. And so as a result of that, we've been able to connect Dr. David Horn with Dr. Professor Maxine Ankara in Uganda. And I mean, what a gem to discover the work that she was doing, uh, to know that she's been living and working in Uganda uh, over 50 years. And she created the Women's Study Department in Makerere in Kampala, Uganda. She's She lived there during Idi Amin. I mean, she literally had to send her children to uh, Kenya to study abroad during that time that her and her husband, they stayed there and said, we won't leave. She was there when uh, Kwame Nkrumah took office in Ghana. Her last I name tell you, hold that story Kwame right there, Kerry. Kim. We've got to take a mm-hmm. short break here. We've got to take our first look at the news, traffic, and weather in our different cities. When we come back, I want you to continue to tell us about your relationship with Dr. Horn. He's one of these unsung heroes, a, a real black man, as, as people would say. You know, He's unapologetically African, a Pan-Africanist. Folks, you want to join this discussion with our guest, Kim Poole, reach out to us at 800-450-7876. We'll take your phone calls in about four minutes right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB. Also in the DMV, we're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, where information is power. And good morning again, family. And thanks for joining us this Monday morning. Our guest is Kim Poole. Kim is a activist out of Baltimore City. If you'd like to speak to her, reach out to us at 800-450-7876. Before we go back to it, let me just remind you, later this morning, we're going to hear from a Kwanzaa creator, Dr. Molana Karenga. Also, who's going to join us, former Louisiana State Trooper, Carl Cavalier, is going to update it on his fight to get his job back. Some of you may recall, you heard him here before. He was he was fired, actually, for blowing the whistle on a group of white state troopers accused of covering up the death of a black motorist. Also, later this week, you're going to hear from activist Chairman Fred Hampton, Fred, Fred Hampton Jr., also a doctor of clinical psychology, Dr. James, Dr. Jerome e. Fox, pardon me, you know him from his best-selling book, Addicted to White, The Oppressed in League with the Oppressor, a shame-based alliance. And also, the president general of the Universal African People's Organization, Brother Zaki Broody, will be here. So make sure your radio's locked in tight all week long, right here in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB. If you're in the DMV, we're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450 WOL. So, Kim, before we left for the uh, traffic and weather update, you were telling us about your association with Dr. David Horn. So I'll let you finish telling us about that. Well, you know, association isn't even the word for me and Dr. David Horn. He's really like a Baba now. 
uh, when I met him, you know, I wasn't even, <laughs> I'll, I'll just say that he was a, a great part of my exposure uh, to real contacts in the international world. And now uh, through our work over the past decade, we've been able to repay that. Uh, when you invest into young people, you get a social return on that investment. And I celebrate our relationship because when I look at a lot of the work we've been able to do in certain regions around the world, it's because he took time with me. I wasn't one of his students. I didn't pay for his services, uh, his uh, teachings, so to speak. I uh, was just one of the young people in the community that said, hey, please invest in me. I'm worth the investment. I promise you'll see a return on this time that you take with me. And he would. And he's in California on the other side of the country. So that's, you know, a commute, right? <laughs> it's not a, a free investment. He would come to events when I had them. Uh, when I was in California, I would seek him out. He would come to the airport. He would pick me up in his car. We would move the stacks of papers to the back seat. And this is a man that has been in the OAU. He was there uh, during in the African Union on the floor in, in Tanzania. He was there when uh, he was a student himself doing this work, and now he is in his late 70s, and he's still doing this work. And so legitimate and a PhD, you know, in academia, we call that the ivory tower of Pan-Africanism because they're writing journals and they're shaping what that looks like. And they don't often connect with grassroots uh, organizers. And so I respect Dr. David Horn so much because he never stopped being grassroots. He understood that grassroots and grass tops have to connect, and only in that connection. I mean, our, our liberation is indivisible. And so he always respected me as an organizer in that regard, and he never uh, thought I wasn't qualified to be at the table simply because my only qualification, though I may have a degree or two, was that I was an artist. And that that was the only one I ever brought to the table at the forefront. And so I respected that, that he respected my voice, even as a young person. And so now we're able to return the favor as an organization. We're able to return the investment back into the Six Region Diaspora Caucus. And that is a part of what our work is going to be next July in Uganda. And so when we left the line, I was talking about uh, Dr. Professor Maxine Ankara and the relationship that I've been able to help facilitate between the two of them, which is the reason that both organizations are going to be in Uganda next July, 8th through the 14th, at the Africa Reclaimed Pan-African Congress. And so they're calling it the Pan-African Congress because there have been so many, and this work with so many major players are going to be at this place having these conversations just like we have been across and throughout history, but it's a conference. And so we look forward to hosting that convening and we'll, of course, add the supplemental art and cultural conversations as a part of that uh, to engage the Ugandan population and young people across the world to participate as well. Right. And Dr. Horn also taught critical thinking. That's why we love to have him here to analyze our issues, because many of our issues, folks, are not just black and white. They're not they're just not that clear. They always they always try to come up with issues to confuse us. That's why we have Dr. Horn who can, uh, you know, sort it out for us. That's why, And I'm glad that he you, he took you under his umbrella. And I know that you're going to learn a lot from just being around Dr. David Horn. But you, you talked about Uganda, but you also had a conference in Zimbabwe. Can you talk about that? We did have a conference in Zimbabwe. So every year, our biggest event, we do events all over the world from Mozambique to West Baltimore. And this year has been one of our busiest. We had the Freedom Rides, where we took young people through 10 cities uh, across the United States, taking history off the page and making the civil rights relevant to young people today. We were at the State of the Black World Conference in April, and we convened the Hip Hop Summit and with Dr. Ron Daniels out of New York doing major work there. We continue with the High Council investment tours. We did the retreat with the women, Heal, Glow, Grow. I mean, the Harriet Tubman Underground Railroad excursion, taking young people camping. This has really been one of our 
busiest years to date, but the conference, the Artisan Conference, is our largest event that we do all year. It's an annual event. We connect artists and art culture to sustainable development, and we start early, by the way. So if you are a speaker that believes uh, that creativity is essential to community and sustainable development, that is essential in business development and in bridging our global conversations, making them global, right, your locale to my locale globally, then please let me know if you want to be a part of our conference next year in Ethiopia. Uh, that in the wonderful Drusilla Dundee, the amazing Ethiopians, the history there and that energy is still uh, as creative as it always was um, in antiquity. And so our conference, we connect artists and art culture to sustainable development. Then we did that. I mean, we some of the people that came to the conference, I'm still digesting and reflecting on the, the heavyweights that came to our conference to be a part of the conversation. When I think about Kevin Douglas Green, Frederick Douglass's great great grandson. I mean, they are twins. They look just alike out of Tennessee. I think about uh, Mama Frida Ayodele out of Ohio. She is an inc a creative artist that's really transforming what we call upcycling. Trash is such a big problem on the continent, and people are getting so many imported plastic items, and they don't know what to do with it. We're just learning what to do with it in the diaspora where they started creating it. And so they're dumping these goods onto the continent, creating these mountains of trash. And then you have artists out of Ohio, like Miss Frida, that are teaching us how to use that creatively and make wonderful pieces of art to reuse that uh, and to make it more than what it was the first time around in its first like life cycle. We had Miss Sylvia Blakely, Reynolds Blakely out of Florida. I mean, I'm just thinking about uh, Obadiah. He's in Israel right now on the ground. He flew in from Israel to our conference. This was an international convening. Uh, you know, people from all over, including all across Zimbabwe, there to have this conversation. Um, it's really a celebration of the fact that we're able to just pull it off. We don't use any, we don't have Bill Gates funding. We don't have uh, the traditional streams where people are giving us, you know, millions and millions of dollars to host these conversations. This is self-funded. And when I say self, I'm talking about Black people like your listeners call that, that see this work as important, that Little grandmothers like Miss Betty Wright, who came with us on the Elders Legacy Tour. Shout out to Miss Betty and Miss Belinda Cawthon because they heard about this work on your show, Carl. And they said, we want to go. I want to take my grandmother, my 80-something-year-old grandmother, to the continent. And she did that this October. People like her that are a part of ourselves that are saying, here's my $10 because my check is limited, but I want to see your work grow. That is what funds the work that we do. And so it's very different from other organizations that I see working to do this work, to facilitate this space, because we don't have the red tape. We do what we think is necessary. Based on our experience, we're able to change on the ground as needed, working with the partners that we choose. And that is what the Artisan Conference is a proud reflection of. It's us for us, by us, and we're using the artist class in their utility in community. In the African worldview, the artists have always been a part of community function and operation, not just art for the sake of art, but Ubuntu, I am because you are, and art has always been a reflection of the needs in our community. And so the artisan conference in Zimbabwe was an opportunity to talk about what some of the local people wanted to discuss too, like their dying languages. Yes, it's a benefit to me that some of them speak English, but they have indigenous languages and they want to talk about how they're dying. They want to talk about how the dam that was built in Victoria Falls is destroying entire legacies of their people's history. They also wanted to talk about sanctions. The U.S. and the sanctions that they have in Zimbabwe are still affecting them. When you drive into the country from the airport, you see that they didn't get their independence until 1980, and they still feel some kind of way about that. Many of the people that attended our conference, young and old, they still remember what it was like to be in Zimbabwe under Mugabe, and they talk about what it was like to grow up 
during their version of colonization, and they they still feel like they need to heal from that process. And so their wounds are very new. And ours, you know, they'll say that they're old, but they just keep cutting open the old wounds with George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And, you know, they just keep cutting the wound over and over, not allowing us to heal. But in Zimbabwe, we did that comparative analysis, and we showed each other our battle scars, and we find pride in that. Like, listen, you survived, and so did we. How can we pick up shovels and build together? I'm not the European Union. I can't come over here and give you a million-dollar budget and just say, go for it. But I'm willing to come over here, roll up my sleeves, and work alongside you and build collectively for both of us. And this conference, in a lot of ways, it was a cornerstone. It allowed us to say, hey, Zimbabwe, we see you. This is just the beginning, and we're ready to work alongside you in partnership. What should we do together? And so they believe it. The journey has just begun. Our conference is like a feasibility study. It's our moving research where we decide, is this region, um, you know, viable? Do they want the diaspora to be here working with them? Are they ready to receive what we have to give? But also, are we ready? As I'll tell you, Carl, I tell you, it's just the honest truth. We're not looking to take everybody to Africa. Some people need to stay right here in the belly of the beast because the culture shock is incredible. Sometimes we have learned so much about the culture. Um, Sometimes we, through our healing process, have battle scars that just won't go away. We don't want people to touch us or get too close. We have our circle of space. And if somebody violates that circle of space, you all up in your feelings. You know, sometimes we... You know, well, hold the thought right there, uh, Kim, because we are take a, another quick break here. We're going to check the traffic and weather in our different cities in the news in Baltimore. When we come back, though, I want to go down that road that you started to talking about uh, personal, because I want to ask you how it, these travels have changed you personal. When you go to these African states in, and you interact with our brothers and sisters on the continent, then you come back to Baltimore and you got to interact with these brothers and sisters here in your home city. How has that changed you? How has it changed your outlook? Let us know. But we, first, we got to check the traffic and weather and the news in Baltimore. We'll be back in four minutes right here at six away from the top of the hour in Baltimore on 1010 WOLB. Also in the DMV, we're on FM 95.9 and AM 1450. WOL, or information is power. Good morning again, family. Uh, Thanks for rolling with us this Monday morning. Our guest is Kim Poole. She's an activist out of Baltimore. And uh, standing by on deck, we have Carl Cavalier. You know his story, Louisiana State Trooper. We'll get to him momentarily. But Kim, before we left for the traffic and weather update, my question to you, how has this changed you as a person? Going to Africa, going to all these African states, and you come back to Baltimore, you deal with black people on both sides of the continent. How has that changed you personally? So, Carl, I hear your question, and we left with me saying that maybe Africa is not ready for all of us to come back. And I think it does have a lot with to do with how it has changed me uh, over the past 15 or so years, uh, traveling back and forth, uh, things around space, uh, whether or not somebody, you know, we give me 50 feet. And so in Africa, people are a lot closer together um, physically. They talk a little closer, hand movements. We never really lost that. I think our tribe still, we talk with our hands, but that you'll find a lot more of that. Um, I think one of the issues around time and what is the definition of productivity. And so I think that in a lot of ways, I was pre disposition uh, to be able to accept that. But, you know, when we say nine o'clock in the diaspora, that means 845, because if you're not there at nine o'clock, and that's just not the case on the continent, because in many ways, they're focused on productivity and outcomes. And so we have adopted that in our organization. And for me personally, it was always a natural fit. What are you doing? Are you just busy? Or are you productive? And sometimes when we have uh, hard 
hit deadlines and timelines, that we focused on outcomes. And so we bring some of that, uh, that what I call indigenous knowledge or ways of being into our work and into our practice. And so sometimes when we do itineraries, we're saying, okay, what do we want to accomplish for today? Not what time do we eat lunch or what time do we eat dinner? What type of dinner do you want to eat? What type of lunch experience do you, who should we invite for lunch? Do you want that person to come? And so a uh, value system, when we say that culture is the new currency, it's us analyzing uh, the how. Culture is the how we operate, the mode of operation. It's not just dance and drumming. It is our way of being. It is the way of living. And so when, when I look at who I am now, and who I was when I first started this journey, I can't say it's so far and uh, different. It's not so wide. What it is, it was confirmation that I wasn't broken, that if I was more focused on the outcome as opposed to how or when we did it, um, that that wasn't uh, foreign, that it was just an African indigenous knowledge system that was inherently in me, um, that when I, uh, you know, was learning about uh, space and what was comfortable and what wasn't, that it wasn't foreign for me to be okay with being a hugger of the world. You know, when I meet people, we dap up, we hug, we uh, have ways of doing that with people that we know, but that has never been foreign to me. It's never felt different or broken. Um, these are some of the simple ways that it shows up. When you are young in Baltimore, you catch the bus before you drive, and I did that from going to Morgan State University on the east side of Baltimore, being from the west side, I had to catch the 33 bus. I don't think they have that anymore. I'm telling on myself. But uh, the way I used to watch women that stood at the front of the bus, they would have this jerk reaction if the kids holding on the poles were about to fall because the bus stopped too short. And they would all reach out simultaneously to grab that baby like it was inherent in them to make sure that child didn't fall, even though it wasn't a child that they gave birth to. These are the remnants of our cultural ways and how they show up in the diaspora. And I'm often, uh, because I'm back and forth, now I'm able to do that comparative analysis to see what just, what was it about us that didn't get lost in the ma'afa or the separation who are we? How are we still African? And then also how we've now uh, encouraged Africa to be more black. I think we kind of need both. I see them in 80 degree weather wearing Timberland boots. It's like, where did you get that from? Why are you wearing Timberland boots? It's because they've seen us in the diaspora. Like you mentioned earlier, hip hop in the 50th anniversary, we see how that shows up. We see their mannerisms when they spit their rhyme or when they, you know, feel like they're doing a freestyle flow and they begin to move their shoulders and hands back and forth as if they're in a boxing match. But really the boxing match is just this word war, this word battle that they're having with each other and how they're in, uh, they're duplicating what we have done. Uh, right. And so uh, for sure we have more in common than we ever had different. Well, well, thanks for sharing that analysis with us. Um, before we let you go, though, how can folks get in touch with you if they want to get on one of your tours to the continent? How do they reach you? Well, you know Kwanzaa is coming up, and that for us, we're so I mean, we're just grateful that Kwanzaa was created. Uh, shout out to the Baba. I know he's coming up next because we use that as one of our greatest marketing tools and opp opportunities to celebrate the work that we're doing. And so this year during Kwanzaa, we have our interest meetings. Uh, so how do we operationalize this global African unity? How does Kwanzaa move beyond just the dashiki and the first fruits and the candles that you light to lighting that light and fire? inside of young people, that candle, right? You are the black candle. And how do we use our work in the Teaching Artists Institute to create opportunities for people to get involved? Well, during Kwanzaa, we have interest meetings. So on December 28th, alongside our mamas and babas in Gainesville, Florida, we're going to be doing Homecoming Ghana. We have a tour next year to Ghana, Homecoming Ghana, and that's going to be on December 28th. On the 27th, we've got Love Camp. That's also to Ghana this year. We have another investment tour that's going to be happening in October. Of course, we're bringing back the Elders Legacy Tour with Mama right. Ide. Well, well, quickly, Kim, because we, so, we got to move on. Can, can, how can folks reach you? Absolutely. 
first and foremost, Facebook.com slash teaching artist, one word. Facebook.com slash teaching artist, one word. Please like us on Facebook. It's low hanging fruit. Look out for our post on Kwanzaa. And again, you can always call me. I'm just Kim from Overwest, 443 739 0941. Again, 443 739 0941. You can always text me. Text me and let me know that you're interested. That's the phone by the bed. I'll make sure I get back to you. All right. Thanks, Kim. Thanks for all that you do, especially for working with our young people.